everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Hawthorne Smith. I am the director of the Bellevue Program for Survivors of Torture. First of all, I want to welcome you and I want to thank you as you are beginning this journey of working with this incredible population of survivors that we are engaged with, people who are just doing incredible things in terms of trying to overcome some of the worst human rights abuses that people go through and trying to reclaim their lives and move forward um, to a much better future. We welcome you. We are a program that has been dealing with thousands of people over the past 25 years, but there are hundreds of thousands who are out there. So anytime that we can engage with motivated and brilliant professionals like you, we want to take the opportunity to do that to try and build out our team. So what we hope to do today is to really speak with you a little bit about the context in which treatment takes place and some of the things we've learned over the years in terms of therapeutic priorities and therapeutic techniques that we have found to be successful. So that being said, again, thank you, and let's get started. I represent the Bellevue Program for Survivors of Torture, and just to let you know a little bit about our organization as you will be partnering with us, we were founded in 1995, so we're in our 26th year of service provision at this point. We have helped to treat more than 6,000 survivors of human rights abuses and torture from around the world, from more than 100 different countries. One of the things we really look at is the fact that we are working with survivors. Our program is known as the Program for Survivors of Torture, as opposed to the Program for Victims of Torture, because we honestly feel that anybody can be a victim. It could be you, it could be me, wrong circumstances, wrong place, wrong time. But to be a survivor means going past victimhood and the bad events and really doing everything that you can to hold on to your sense of humanity, despite the violent and purposeful attempts people have made to destroy or at least compromise one's sense of humanity. So we are here to really help rebuild the, the minds, the bodies, the spirits of survivors, of people who have been tortured or persecuted. So a couple things to know about our program is that we are a holistic program. We do not see mental health issues as being over there, um, legal and immigration issues here, physical, medical health issues here. It really all works together in the context of a whole human being. And we are very much a resilience-based program. Again, we are not just dealing with victims, we are dealing with survivors who teach us every single day. You'll notice the two pictures of Bellevue Hospital. One is kind of old school. One is a bit more modern, and it really reflects two faces of a coin. We are at the center of a very unique and you know scientifically driven institution. So we definitely believe in evidence-based practice. But at the same time, we are the nation's oldest public institution, public hospital, and we learn a lot from our clients. So we also do not want to throw out the aspect of practice-based evidence and what we learn on the day-to-day. -day. We really hope to put these two things together for you um, in a way that will be useful as you begin to work with the incredible client population that we work with. So let me start by asking you folks a few questions. Have you ever written a letter to the editor? Have you written a blog post or something like that? Have you responded to something online? Have you ever voted in an election? Are you a woman? Do you belong to an identified religious group? Do you not belong to an identified religious group? Have you ever participated in a demonstration? Do you belong to an identifiable racial or ethnic group? Do you have or are you personally close to somebody who has a sexual orientation other than heterosexual? So the reason I ask these questions is because many times one of the first questions we are asked when we're doing a training like this is, who are these torture survivors? You know, it sounds like some sort of exotic othered group. But what I can say is that if you raised your hand or nodded your head to any of these questions, I can honestly respond by saying that the people we work with are people just like you. 
people who have been persecuted due to how they believe or the religion in which uh, uh, they believe, um, who have been persecuted because they are women. And the way that modern warfare seems to be put forth these days, the evidence of sexually based trauma and attacks are just off the charts. Because one belongs to a particular racial or ethnic group, uh, because of an, an expressed political opinion, all of these different things could put you into that same sort of calabash, that same bucket of the clients we work with. This is not about an identified other. This is about us in a sense of shared humanity. The other thing I will often do with um, people who ask about this is I'll, I'll have the participants in a training fill out a piece of paper where on that piece of paper, anonymously, they will write down three or perhaps five of the most important things in your life. And people will take the time, they write down, and I collect the papers anonymously. And again, we're not in the same room, but what I would do is read from your responses. And oftentimes we get responses like somebody's name or a relationship, like being a parent, being a spouse, um, dreams, uh, you know, educational aspirations, professional aspirations, the ability to worship the way someone wants to. But what I will do then after reading through these responses is to take the responses and in a fit of sort of overblown theatrics, I rip the responses to shreds. And I will ask the audience to consider their lives. If the things they had written down on that piece of paper had been purposely and violently ripped away from them and that they were currently unable to reclaim any of those things that make life worth living, overblown theatrics aside, this is in some senses the scenario, the context in which we are working with our clients. Again, we are dealing with people who have suffered multiple losses, but it's not just one snapshot in time. We're not dealing with someone who had a particularly bad day in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We are dealing with people who are experiencing the ongoing effects of recurrent and reinforcing trauma. We are working with clients who have gone through some sort of social dislocation, whether that be a rebel insurgency, um, a civil war, ethnic cleansing, religious intolerance, homophobic persecution, etc. But there's some significant trauma they have gone through. Oftentimes they are held in prison and sort of tortured in the classical sense, if I can use my air quotes here. But we are also dealing with people who have somehow escaped from prison or perhaps been released and then live as internally displaced people in their home country. They may flee across the border to a neighboring country and a very non-scientific sort of um, assessment will say that four times out of five, somebody who is fleeing a violent, impoverished, chaotic country and goes across the border is being received in a violent, chaotic, impoverished country and that there are often xenophobic reactions. So people are dealing with that. But again, we're not doing most of our work overseas. It's people coming here who have dealt with the refugee camps, perhaps in their home country or their neighboring country, come here. Maybe they've been placed in detention here in the United States or outside of detention, they come to us here at Bellevue where they're now dealing with New York City and all of our infamous warmth and fuzziness and dealing with resettlement stressors. As you can see, we're not just dealing with one bad day, we are dealing with ongoing, recurrent stressors that really serve to keep the trauma alive in the present. So when we talk about diagnoses, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder, are we really dealing with something that is post? Or are we dealing with ongoing recurrent stressors that serve once again to keep this trauma alive for our clients? So we have to question the P. What about the D? Imagine for yourself if everything you had written on that piece of paper was ripped away from you. Might it affect your sleep? Might it affect your mood? Is it a disorder? Or are we dealing with people who are dealing with sick circumstances as opposed to being sick themselves? An abnormal situation as opposed to being abnormal people. Keep in mind that everybody that is traumatized does not necessarily manifest full-blown PTSD. People will react to this in different ways. And here's where we really begin to get into the aspect of how does someone react 
to this sort of ongoing trauma. So another question that we are asked frequently is why? Why do people do this? Why does torture exist? And one of the things that we have learned over time is it really is about the systematic negation of the person. Those are the words of Franz Fanon. And what we look at is sometimes torture being used to break the will of an individual so that they can further oppress or break the will of a community. So many of the people we are dealing with had leadership positions or were pillars of their community and the purposeful attacks on them were put out there to help cow or to really help place their community in a place where they could be oppressed even more. And we understand that this can oftentimes be part of the, the rationale behind torture. So we notice that torture has all kinds of ramifications and you know we, we often think about the physical scars of torture. But we see everything from burns to amputations to broken bones to scarring to female genital cutting and mutilation. The physical ramifications are significant. But as a psychologist and for someone who takes part in this interdisciplinary team, we often see that the emotional scars of torture can be just as painful, if not more painful and longer lasting than the physical scars. As um, a, a doctor, a colleague of mine once said, it's easier to kill a microbe than it is to kill a memory. And that many times our clients are dealing with the emotional ramifications for years. Something that might not leave a scar, like um, a mock execution, where someone is led in front of an audience, perhaps blindfolded, and they can feel the gun placed at their temple. They think that this is the last moment they will have on, on earth. They can tell you what the cold steel feels like next to their temple. They can tell you about the click that they hear. And it might be that click that has been waking them up every night for the last four or five years. No scar to be seen, but the emotional scars of torture last for a very long time. And again, this is part of what we tend to look at in terms of our interdisciplinary team because what happens and the, the ramifications of trauma are complex and intertwining. If you look at this design of this, this flower, we have five different areas that are affected. Understand that none of this happens in a vacuum. These are not silos. Every lobe of this flower comes back to the middle. The dark circle in the middle is where we live. Someone who, for example, is having nightmares based on what they've gone through, an emotional reaction, if you don't sleep very well that night, it can have physical ramifications. You might wake up really drowsy. You might have a headache. It might impact the way that you're thinking about things. Um, we see many clients who are having difficulty with memory, with concentration that they didn't experience before the trauma, which can make them want to self-medicate. So maybe someone is drinking more than they did before, or um, maybe they are using drugs or doing something like that, where, you know, maybe a New Yorker we see that having, you know, one or two beers to help you get, a, get to sleep at night might not be a big thing in New York. But if you've grown up, if you've grown up as a, a devout Muslim and drinking al alcohol is haram, then drinking those two beers is a big thing. The question about spirituality, do people really lean on their religion or do some people give up on the religion because God has abandoned them? And again, all these things happen, but they feed back to the middle. Someone who is suffering spiritually is going to have ramifications in terms of how they are emotionally. In many cases, we have clients, for example, some of our clients from Tibet who in their language do not have a word for depression or stress, but they might come in and tell us that I'm having belly aches or I'm having headaches. And when we don't see a biological or medical etiology, it means that it's coming somewhere else. So the real bottom line here is that there are multiple, multiple ways that our clients are really, really challenged. The good news with that, and we're going to get to in the next segment, is that it means that there are multiple ways that we can intervene and make a tangible difference. But let us just say for now that all of these different areas where someone can be hurt, it sort of comes back to the middle of this flower, and that's where the survivors live. I spoke about PTSD earlier, and again, we have the caveats in terms of the P and the D, but I at least wanted to take 
a, a moment to talk about some of the ways that um, people are impacted that go along with this diagnosis, that there would be symptoms of intrusion, um, nightmares, flashbacks, intrusive thoughts, avoidance, where people will try to avoid situations, scenarios, thoughts, um, reminders of what they've been through. There might be um, negative alterations in cognition and mood. I spoke earlier about memory difficulties, lack of concentration, exaggerated blame, self-blame, getting mad at others, and also alterations in arousal, reactivity, hypervigilance. Um, we've seen clients who come here at Bellevue and my goodness, with the noise and things going on here, something that we might ignore might be really, really activating for someone else. So I put all of these out there and it sounds like a very kind of comprehensive diagnosis, but it doesn't talk about guilt. It doesn't talk about mourning. One of our psychiatrists, Dr. Asher Alajam, famously taught me when I first started here, we do not treat diagnoses. We treat people who have a constellation of symptoms, a context in which they are working and personal strengths that they have. And we really try to put that together. So please keep PTSD in mind as we talk about these different reactions, but not all trauma leads to PTSD. It is not the only game in town. Not only are we talking about what's going on internally for someone, but it can really manifest in terms of how people engage with us. Trauma. The fear, the anxiety that goes with that can really affect someone's ability to process information. We've talked about concentration and memory. It may affect one's ability or even their willingness to talk about their memories or even engage with you. So someone might not just be being uh, you know, resistant, it just might be so difficult for them to talk about. Um, their ability to relate to other people, to even think about the future, their feelings about the world may be changed. Their feelings about themselves may be changed. And again, these are things that might be manifested in their time with you in a clinical or a service provision encounter. Um, but it's always good to keep in mind the impact trauma might have in interpersonal relationships, as opposed to just sort of chalking it up to someone's personality per se. So another educational consideration is what to do with, for example, a 17 year old girl who has spent the last three years in a refugee camp and not been in school. Do we place her with her age cohort, which makes sense developmentally, but she would be three years behind in terms of the academic work? Or do we place her with the 14 year olds where she might be in line with the academic assignments, but development, developmentally would be out of step. These are some of the stressors that people are feeling educationally. In terms of social services, et cetera, again, we are dealing with many clients who were the breadwinners for their extended families and really have um, a great deal of pride in terms of not asking for charity, not asking for things. We have had clients who have walked from the South Bronx down to Bellevue because they had not wanted to take a Metro card for the subway. So again, even just engaging in some of the social service provision and, you know, realizing that the services we want to provide, as we learned greatly during the COVID pandemic, are not always sufficient to what we are trying, what, what the need is. Legal advocacy, I'd say probably about 95% of the clients who come to us are either in the asylum process or will be in the asylum process. So engaging in these interviews, going to immigration court are things that are part and parcel of what they will have to go through, even if someone has lived their life. And again, with a great deal of pride, as I've never been arrested, I've never been taken to a court before, the legal circumstances will be part of their experiences here. The vocational professional situation they're dealing with it has been said that, you know, you never know who's sweeping your floor. You never know who's driving your taxi. You never know who's stocking your shelves, um, particularly as we look at what has happened over the last 15 months with the COVID pandemic. Clients in our program have proven themselves to be essential to our community in helping us to, su to survive. But oftentimes these are people, again, who had leadership positions in, in their home country. They may have been lawyers, they may have been journalists, they may have been physicians. 
but now they are doing the menial work. They're working as home health attendants. They are, again, picking fruit. They are stocking shelves, anything to really hold on. So levels of professional disempowerment are, are definitely things that we deal with. And social functioning, coming to a country where you don't speak the language, where you're, some of the families of children are being teased in school. I remember being out in um, Fargo, North Dakota, where they had settled a number of the um, lost boys from Sudan. And these young men were doing much better now. They had jobs, they'd gone to school. The lost boys are now the lost young men. Um, but North Dakota at one point was about 96% white. I think when I visited, it was about 89%, so still significantly. These young men, even though they were doing very well, it was very lonely for them in terms of dating. And many of these young men said, hey, I'm 23, 24 years old here. I'm very happy to be going to school. I'm safer here, I love this. But if I were back in my home country, I would be married by now. I would be starting my family. And um, that was not the reality that they were looking for. Looking at what's happening internally for somebody, what's happening relationally, and also what is happening in terms of their ability to navigate and engage in the society. And this might look familiar to you, but if you look at the words, here we are not dealing with all of the various stressors our clients are dealing with, but we're beginning to look at different ways to engage. We are not operating in a vacuum. What is happening in terms of medical treatment is aligned with what we are trying to do in terms of emotional relief, what we are doing in terms of legal um, connections, community connections. Again, where the person lives is the center of this flower because any progress we're able to do in any sort of way will help them in multiple ways. And again, the bad news is that our clients are so multiply challenged. The good news is that there's so many different ways to intervene. But again, what we're going to go into in the next segment will be ways that we engage with this incredible client population that we're working with and how we bring our interdisciplinary services to bear so that hopefully they can deal with what they've been through in the past, navigate the present so that they can build a better future.